Hi, this is Professor Stugard, and in this video we're going to talk more about matrix multiplication, specifically talking about the concepts of the identity and the inverse. So, our goals for this video, first of all we need to review how matrix multiplication works, because these two concepts really rely on that whole idea of matrix multiplication, and it's just a good idea to remember the process and how matrix multiplication actually works, especially since 99% of the time, we're probably just going to have the computer do all those calculations for us. It's our job as humans to still understand how that structure works. Then we can actually talk about what an inverse is and what an identity is and how they are related to each other. And then lastly, we'll look at a quick example of how we can use matrix multiplication and this concept of identities and inverses to actually help us solve different types of problems in mathematics using this linear algebra structure. Because again, the whole concept here is that linear algebra is just a structure, a way for us to really express these different types of ideas in, well, matrix form. And then the wonderful, wonderful ways that it can actually make our lives much easier when we look at problems in this context. So first of all, let's review that matrix multiplication. So what I want you to think of matrices as now is really grids, right? We, we talked about the indexing and we talked about how there's rows and columns and each different spot in this matrix uh, has its own element, has its own entry. And so Again, I think it helps to think of it as kind of like a grid where we're looking at all, all these different elements. Um, so I'm going to skip the typical matrix notation for now, just so we can get an idea of kind of the concept and review that concept of matrix multiplication uh, visually. So first of all, when we do matrix multiplication, it's important that we look at the dimensions and then um, we have to make sure that the dimensions of the number of columns of my first matrix match the dimensions of rows from my second matrix. Although from now on, we're gonna call them the left matrix and the right matrix, because as we saw before, the order that we multiply matrices in matters. It's not like rather regular arithmetic where two times three and three times two are still gonna give us the same number. Matrix multiplication does not work that way. So. When I multiply a three by three and a three by three, my result is also going to be a three by three. And this is really a nice property of square matrices. If we multiply two square matrices with the same dimension, we know that the resulting matrix is gonna be that same size. So when we multiply matrices, remember, it's going to be the row from the left times the column from the right matrix. And when we combine those, that gives us our entry in our resulting matrix. So it's good to think about that entry in your resulting matrix first. So again, we would typically start with this first element, which again, the indexing here would be one, one, because it's row one, column one. And then again, from our left matrix, we need row one. And from our right matrix, we use column one. And then what we do is we, uh, well, we're gonna multiply and add. And to just kind of review that process, Let's use general variables. Let's say my left matrix, that first row is ABC. For my right matrix, it's the column XYZ. To find that entry for element 1, 1 in my resulting product, we do, uh, we multiply each component. So A times X, B times Y, C times Z, and then sum them together. And remember, this is called our inner product or our dot product for multiplying vectors. So that's how we would find that entry for that particular column. How would I find this? So again, this is where we want to make sure we still understand these concepts of how matrix multiplication works. So let's say I want to find the value that's going to go in that cell. How would I do it? Well, first of all, we need to make sure we know which cell that is. So when I index that cell, what is going to be my index for that cell? Well, it's going to be element two, three, because it's in row two, column three. It's always the row first, then the column. So when I look at my first two matrices, what do I need for my left matrix and what do I need for my right matrix? Well, for element two, three, that means I'm going to need row two from my left matrix and column three from my right matrix. And then again, perform that inner product between those two, uh, between that row and that column, and that will give me my resulting answer. 
So again, row two from the left, column three from the right, and that gives me element two, three in my resulting product. All right, so we're not gonna go through a whole bunch more. We, we reviewed that matrix multiplication. It's a good idea to always keep that in your head somewhere. Um, one of those things where, you know, maybe on the first of the month, multiply a three by three matrix times a three by three matrix. Take you probably less than five minutes and it will start to make sure that that process is ingrained in your head so that you know how to take advantage of it later. If you only rely on the computer to do all your math for you and you never do it by hand and you never work through the concepts, your brain's never going to well, store that connection up there. And you'll never be able to create something new because you won't understand how the structures work. So the first of every month, multiply two matrices together. And that should be enough for your brain to say, hey, this is important. And start coding that neural pathway in the mycelium and make sure that it's preserved for all time. Okay, but let's move on to the whole point of this video, which is going to be talking about the identities and the inverses. So we're gonna start with the identity. Now, the identity is not something that is unique to linear algebra. It's actually a concept that is uh, very abstract and across all types of algebra and even arithmetic. So the identity element is the element that when an operation is applied between the identity and another element, it leaves the original element unchanged. That's a mouthful. Really, the identity is our do nothing element, meaning that if we apply the identity, it doesn't change a thing. So when we do addition, right, regular arithmetic, the additive identity is zero because any number plus zero doesn't change it, right? N plus zero is still N. I added zero and nothing changed. It was my do nothing element. Now, the important part to recognize here is that every identity is also linked to the operation that we're doing. Because if I'm talking about multiplication, well, now the multiplication, the multiplicative identity is one. It's not zero. If I multiply by zero, everything becomes zero. It doesn't, that actually does change it. But if I multiply by one, it does not change my original value. Any number times one is gonna still be that number. So again, this concept of identity is very much tied to the operation we are also performing on that particular uh, set of elements or, or what the rules are for that type of element. Uh, and this concept of an identity goes much deeper and you'll see it in all these concepts like abstract algebra and, and, and um, you know, it, it's a fairly deep concept that's going to keep coming back over and over again. But we're going to talk about it in the context of matrices and linear algebra. So the identity matrix in linear algebra, and this is for matrix multiplication. Again, we need to make sure we specify our operation. If it was matrix addition, then it would have to just be the zero matrix, but we're talking about matrix multiplication. Um, and so the identity matrix is going to be a square matrix. And so again, we typically denote, denote that as N by N, meaning N rows and N columns with ones along that main diagonal. All right. So from the top left to the bottom right, those are ones. And then it's zeros everywhere else. And when we give the identity, we either give it as an I or sometimes we do I sub N for the size of our square matrix. So in this case, I showed you the I three matrix um, because it's a three by three. And again, we have the ones in the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. Now, whenever we multiply by that identity matrix, our original matrix will remain unchanged. And this is true whether we left multiply or right multiply, which is actually kind of cool because now we actually do have that commutivity and it will make life a lot easier. So given any square matrix A and identity I of the same dimension, A times I is A, and I times A is also A. Again, it doesn't change it. It leaves our original matrix A exactly the same, whether we left multiply or right multiply. And again, we do need to specify that for matrix multiplication. Now, let's take a look really briefly about why that actually works. Why would multiplying by the identity change nothing? So here I have a just random matrix I came up with, one, two, one, two, zero, three, four, one, one. So let's say I wanna find my first entry, one, one. Again, that's gonna require the first row of the left and the first column from the right matrix. And so if you look at that column though, in my, my identity matrix, we have two zeros there, which we know that when we multiply by zero, those things are gonna go away. And if you look, those two zeros, when I multiply, they're gonna to correspond to the second and third entries in that 
row in my left matrix, which means the only thing that's left is going to be that first entry, which is a one. And yeah, when I multiply anything by one, one times one is still one, which means that my entry here is going to be one. Now, if I move on and I do, let's say that entry two, three that we just reviewed a second ago, now the column I'm using is that third column in my identity matrix, which means the first entry and the second entry are now zeros. And when I make those correspond to my row and get rid of the first and second, then I'm all I'm left with is that three. Three times one is three, so the resulting answer is gonna be three. And if I do that for every single element, we'll see that we actually get back to that original. Uh, again, not bad practice for you to actually go through and fill out the rest of this matrix on your own, uh, but that's not really the purpose of this video, so I'm going to keep going ahead. You can absolutely, and I recommend that you verify that this works, and I, I encourage you to also do it with the identity as your left matrix to see why left multiplying by the identity is still going to leave your original matrix unchanged. Next concept is the inverse. So the inverse element is the element that when an operation is applied between the inverse and another element, it results in the identity. So the inverse is basically how do we get back to that identity? How do we get back to that do nothing? So quick example. So in addition, the inverse of five is going to be negative five because if I add five and negative five, I get back to zero, which is my additive identity. In multiplication though, the inverse of five is going to be one fifth because five times one fifth gets me back to one, my multiplicative identity. So again, it's very important to recognize the operation that we're doing here um, when it comes to the concept of inverses. We do need to specify what operation it is we are working with. So the inverse of a matrix is typically given as a to the negative one. Um, also, when we talk about uh, inverse matrices, typically we have to talk about square matrices. Uh, square matrices are gonna be the ones that have the inverses because the identity is also a square matrix. And with the inverse, this is another one where whether you left multiply or right multiply by the inverse, you should still get back to your original identity. So again, that's the two notations there. A times A inverse is the identity, and also A inverse times A is also my identity. So let's say I have this matrix A. Again, it's the same one from before, one, two, one, two, zero, three, four, one, one. Now, there is a very clever way to get to the inverse and to find that yourself. Um, but again, this is one of those things that in practice, typically we're just gonna let technology find our inverse matrices for us. Um, so I'm gonna skip that step. You can certainly look that up on your own. It's, it's kind of clever and not that hard. So I, I do encourage you to look that up on your own. But when I use technology, the inverse to that matrix is this negative 3 19ths, negative 1 19th, 6 19ths, and it, see how it got kind of a lot uglier there? And if we look really closely, hopefully we see a pattern here that these are all fractions and they're all divided by the number 19. So there's gotta be something to do with that there. And absolutely there is. It has to do with the concept of the determinant, which we will cover in another video on another day. Uh, but there's absolutely a reason that we have those 19s in each of my denominator. Now, it is very, very important to also recognize here that not every matrix has an inverse. There are some matrices that do not have inverses, that you will never be able to find another matrix that when you multiply them together, gets you back to the identity. Now, this is actually part of a huge theorem, and actually, usually, it's the focus of an entire course in linear algebra at the university level, uh, usually at the, the beyond calculus level, where you cover this idea called the invertible matrix theorem. And the invertible matrix theorem is so incredibly important in linear algebra because it proves that there are many different properties of these invertible matrices that are related. If a matrix has an inverse, it is actually equivalent to a list of 20 something other properties that we now know about that particular matrix, which is really, really cool and super duper powerful. And one of the main reasons that linear algebra is such an amazing subject and works so incredibly well for so many things that we do. Now, let's go back to some matrix multiplication and we can see how we can actually apply these concepts to different scenarios. So let's say I wanna multiply these two matrices together. Again, good idea, we gotta check, oh, can I actually multiply these? These aren't both square matrices, so do the, the, do the dimensions match up in a way that I can multiply them? Well, my first one is a three by three. 
My second one is a three by one. So again, that's three rows in one column, right? The row always comes first. When we wanna know whether or not we can multiply two matrices, we have to make sure that the kind of the, those inner numbers match. And then the outer numbers are gonna tell us the dimensions of my resulting matrix. So when I do this multiplication, my result is going to be a three by one matrix. So three rows and one column. I'm actually going to not write it out in matrix notation. I'm going to leave the, the, the brackets out for now, which I think is fine. And we're going to go through the multiplication. So the first row times the first column, because it's the only column that exists here. Now, when I multiply these, I get 1 times x, 2 times y, 1 times z, and add those all together. So that's x plus 2y plus z. Then we go down to the next row. And again, there's only the one column there. So then we have 2 times x, 0 times y, 3 times z, or 2x plus 0y plus 3z. And we do that last row, 4, 1, 1, we get 4x plus y plus z. Well, wait, what does this look like? Well, this looks surprisingly like a system of equations, except it's not equations because there's no equal sign. Equations are only when we have the equal sign. If there's no equal sign, then it's simply an expression. So now I have just these three expressions. So let's turn this into an actual equation, which means I'm going to consider the system of equations, right? This following system of linear equations, I gotta have an equal sign there somewhere. So we know that multiplication on the left, we know what's gonna happen. We know that it results in a three by one matrix. On the right hand side, we also have a three by one matrix, which again, we're gonna be able to match up. They're equal, so they will equal the components. So that first row equals one. Uh, so x plus two y plus z equals one, two x plus zero y plus three z equals five, four x plus y plus z equals six. And now we have a system of equations. And any time we see a system of equations where I have three equations now and three unknowns, your intuition should probably be, let's solve this system. What values of x, y, and z are going to make these equations true? And that is typically how we solve systems, right? Except now that we know linear algebra, we can actually solve this system in a incredibly clever way. But first, Let's actually name our different matrices here. So I still have my matrix A, it's been the same matrix A for the whole time. I'm gonna call that, uh, that matrix, that three by one of my variables, I'm gonna call that X. And then the column, uh, that one, one column matrix there is going to be B with the, the one, five, and six. Which means this system is actually going to look like A times X equals B. So I was actually able to take this system and represent it in a much more compact notation, which is super, super useful. Now, again, this is just a three by three. It wouldn't be uncommon to have like a hundred by a hundred, right? We can have these huge matrices, especially with big data. So being able to use a very compact notation, like in linear algebra, becomes super duper useful. Except now I have this equation AX equals B. And the question now becomes, well, if I want to solve my system, I need to find X. I need to find X just like I would basically solve any other equation. So how am I going to get X by itself? Now, we don't have division in our matrix world. We don't have division in matrix, uh, in our matrix math, I guess, or our linear algebra. So what we have to do is instead use the inverse. So if I left multiply both sides by a inverse, and again, this is very important that we make sure that we do the same thing to both sides here. So when we do the same thing to both sides, that means we need to either left multiply both sides or right multiply both sides. Um, we need to make sure that we're very, very consistent. So we don't have division, we have inverses. But if you think about, <laughs> when we talked about the inverses for addition, right, negative five or multiplication one fifth, we're actually doing that same exact idea when we solve basic equations back in like algebra one. So anyway, when I look at that left-hand side though, A inverse times A, we know that's the identity. So A inverse times A is my identity. So I have my identity times X, but my identity times anything is just that anything. So it's just X, which means X, my the thing I'm trying to solve for is really just A inverse times B. So all I need to do is perform that matrix multiplication for my answer. And so here's my A inverse, right? It's that kind of ugly matrix with lots of fractions all being, you know, all with denominators to 19. I'm going to multiply that times B, that matrix one, five, six. And again, I'm using technology here. We know the resulting matrix is going to be a three by one. So I have 28 over 19, negative 11 over 19 and 13 over 19 as my resulting matrix. 
which means that matrix XYZ equals well, those three fractions, which simplified really means X, right? When we match those corresponding com components, those corresponding elements, X is 28 over 19, Y is negative 11 over 19, and Z is 13 over 19. And I just solved that system of equations and found those really ugly answers by simply using linear algebra, which is awesome. So the idea here is that given any system represented as AX equals B, no matter what size it is, as long as we have square matrices, if A is invertible, so again, that's that, that invertible matrix theorem popping up again, which also means if I don't have an inverse, would I be able to do this? So if a matrix doesn't have an inverse, could I find a solution? Does that mean that system doesn't have a solution? Maybe. Again, that's something we'll have to explore more as we learn more about the invertible matrix theorem. But those are good questions, and those are questions that we should probably, hopefully, be asking ourselves if we're paying enough attention here. All right. But if A is invertible, then the solution to that system is always going to be A inverse times B. And we can use that no matter what to solve our system, which I think is just so clever. So that wraps up this, I, this uh, video. So can you answer the following questions? Number one, how does matrix multiplication work? Remember, review that concept. How do I multiply two matrices together? When I use that inner product, how do I match up the rows and the columns? How does that work? Again, that's got to stay in your mind if you ever want to create something interesting. Number two, what is that identity and what's the inverse, right? That's the whole point of this video. What does the identity do? What does the inverse do? And then number three, can you explain now how we used linear algebra to solve that system of equations in that last example? Can you explain that yourself? All right, so that's gonna wrap it up for this video. I hope we learned something. I hope we found it somewhat interesting. And as always, well, take care of yourselves.